Analytical Chemistry 1, Lesson 41. Inorganic salts are ionic compounds, often involving metal cations. They are grouped in different ways depending on the need. We might talk about the group 1 compounds, or we might want to discuss the carbonate-bearing species as a group. Of their many properties, we will focus on the way they dissolve when placed in water. Their aqueous solubility shows a very wide range of behavior. Some substances dissolve completely when put in water. Think here about table salt. Other substances have a very limited solubility. Think here about chalk, which is calcium carbonate. Nickel chloride can be dried to become an anhydrous salt. It is dark yellow in color. Take a beaker with 1 milliliter, 100 milliliters of water in it and start adding some of this salt. It quickly dissolves and turns the water to a lovely green color. You continue to add the anhydrous dark yellow solid. It continues to dissolve and the solution's color becomes a more intense green. You continue to add the solid until after you have added 67.5 grams, at which point uh, the solid begins to collect on the bottom of the beaker. The solid has turned to a lovely green color, but it is no longer dissolving in the water. Adding more solid does not produce any more solvation. We say that the solution has become saturated with the nickel. In fact, it has formed the hex aqua complex of the nickel 2 plus ion. That's what gives it its color. With the molar mass of the anhydrous nickel chloride, we find that this 67.5 grams corresponds to 0.521 moles. The molar solubility of nickel chloride is 0.521 moles per 100 milliliters, or 5.21 moles per liter. Once undissolved chloride remains in the bottom of the beaker, you have obtained a saturated solution of nickel chloride. The chemical reaction that describes the solvation process and the phases are important in these equations. Take the ionic solid and separates the ions which are dissolved in the aqueous solution. The equilibrium constant, which usually is subscripted with an SP for solubility product, is formed as usual, the activity of the products over that of the reactants. But recall that the substances in the solid state have an activity of 1, since their reference state is just the solid itself, making our us usual approximations. To uh, ignore activity coefficients, uh, the solubility product for the solvation of the nickel chloride is just the nickel concentration times the square of the chloride concentration. So be sure to appreciate that the KSP equation is an equilibrium constant. It's only applicable if the system is at equilibrium. And until you've added more than the 67.5 grams to 100 milliliters of water, the system is not yet at equilibrium. But once solid nickel chloride starts collecting on the bottom of the beaker, then a dynamic equilibrium between the solvated ions and the solid state material exists. Then the equilibrium equation has meaning. There's 5.21 moles per liter of nickel 2 plus that has dissolved at equilibrium. And by the stoichiometry, 10.42 moles per liter of chloride ion is also dissolved. Plug those into the equation to find the value for KSP. It's 565.7. There's no units, remember, everything's divided by its reference state. Now this is a very large number for a solubility equilibrium constant. That we have to add so much before we achieve equilibrium characterizes the nickel chloride as being very soluble in water. By contrast, uh, take some uh, manganese carbonate. It is a pale pink solid that has a role to play as a component of fertilizer. It's been used in health foods, in ceramics as a colorant on glazes, and for staining concrete. Drop a very small piece into a beaker of water, and hardly anything is observed to happen other than the piece of manganese carbonate sinking to the bottom and staying there. Such a substance is said to be sparingly soluble. Some would even say insoluble. Some careful spectroscopic work would reveal that a very small amount of material has indeed dissolved into the solution and the tiniest amount of solid was readily able to establish equilibrium with some dissolved ions. In this case, we would find that the manganese 2 plus concentration was 2.24 times 10 to the minus 5 molar, and the same for the carbonate ion concentration from the stoichiometry. A solubility product is written down for it, and the value for the KSP must be 5 times 10 to the minus 10. Now, a number this small is indicative of a sparingly soluble ionic salt. There are even more insoluble compounds. Uranium oxide, for instance, has a KSP in the range of 10 to the minus 56. It is useful to know which ionic solids are very soluble and those that are only sparingly soluble. Each ionic compound consists of a cationic species and an anion. Knowing these groups provides some nice rule of thumb guidance to their solubility. Soluble compounds include those whose anion is an acetate, a nitrate, or a hypochlorite. There are not any exceptions to this rule. 
Additionally, compounds with cations of sodium, potassium, and ammonium are soluble, and there are no exceptions here either. Compounds with anions from the heavier halogens, chloride, bromide, and iodide, are soluble except when combined with silver, the mercurous ion, uh, copper 1+, plus, and lead 2+. Plus. Other soluble compounds are formed with the sulfate ion, except when the uh, cation is calcium, strontium, barium, lead, silver, and mercurous ion. These exceptions are, of course, by definition, of varying degrees of, sparing, of being sparingly soluble. The wider spectrum of sparingly soluble compounds includes the sulfides, where the anion is just S2-. Exceptions occur with an ammonium cation as well as with all of the alkali metals, such as lithium, sodium, potassium, and so on, and also the alkaline earth metals, such as beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium. Carbonate salts are widely found to be insoluble, except, again, when combined with ammonium or the alkali or alkaline earth metals. A similar situation arises with compounds formed with the phosphate anion and the hydroxide anion. They exhibit the same exceptions as well. Finally, we mention the fluoride species. In contrast to the other halogens, just look back up at the table above. These are sparingly soluble, except for ammonium fluoride. Now, there are many more possible anions and cations that need to be considered, but these tables list the common ones for which these trends are useful to understand. We can always go to tables and look up the KSP. Usually, these tables consist only of the sparingly soluble salts. If you look up a compound that is soluble on, for instance, Wikipedia, you will often find its solubility listed among its other properties. One experimentally observed property is the molar, molar solubility of a salt. When placed in water, and when some undissolved solid is present so that the solvation process is at equilibrium, then what is the molar amount of dissolved material per liter of solution? Silver bromide is sparingly soluble. We look up its KSP and find a value of 5 times 7 minus 13. The chemical equation is just the solid becoming the aqueous ions, and the equilibrium equation is just the product of the concentration of the two species being equated to the KSP value. So what is the molar solubility? The stoichiometry points out that when an ion of silver dissolves, an ion of bromine must also dissolve. Whatever their concentrations in solution, they must be equal. Let S equate these concentrations, and we can readily see how to solve the problem. The molar, molar solubility must be just the square root of Ksp, or 7.1 times 7 minus 7 molar. And this must also be the concentration of each of the solvated ions. The stoichiometry is the one aspect of these problems to look out for. Now here's a slightly more complex problem. Thorium fluoride, ThF4, has a Ksp of 5.1 times 10 to the minus 29. The solvation equation points out that whatever the equilibrium ion concentrations are, the fluoride ion must be four times that of the thorium ion. The equilibrium constant expression must have thorium to the first power, but fluoride to the fourth power. Let S equal the thorium equilibrium concentration, then the fluoride equilibrium concentration must be 4S. Substitute these in, and Ksp must equal S times 4S to the fourth power, or 256 times s to the fifth power. Solving for s gives us 7.2 times 10 to the minus 7 molar for the molar solubility. Now watch out, this is the fifth root, not the square root. On your calculator, you usually have a power function, x to the y. A root operation is the power raised to the reciprocal of the desired root. In this case, 1 fifth is 0 0.2, so this means the argument is raised to the 0 0.2 power. We find that 7.2 times the minus 7 moles of THF4 dissolves per liter of solution at equilibrium. And this is also the equilibrium concentration of the thorium 4 plus ion. The equilibrium concentration of fluoride, however, must be 4 times this, or 2.9 times 10 to the minus 6 molar. One more example. Lanthanum oxalate has a KSP of 1.2 times 10 to the minus 25. Here is the balanced chemical reaction equation and the equilibrium expression for the solvation process. The mass balance equation, now we've really been using that uh, previously, but we haven't been specifically mentioning it. It reminds us that the molar solubility S must produce a lanthanum plus concentration of 2S and an oxalate concentration of 3S. Substitute and solve for S, Ksp equals 4S squared times 27S cubed or 108S to the fifth. So S is 4.1 times 10 to the minus 6 molar. 
This is the molar solubility of the salt. But the lanthanum ion concentration is twice this, 8.2 times 10 to the minus 6 molar, and the oxalate ion concentration is three times this, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5 molar. Always make sure you recognize the difference between the molar solubility of the salt and the concentration of the various ions which arise from it. The differences are all in the stoichiometry.